Hey, uh, good afternoon. Uh, we are live here uh, from the offices of the Five Towns Jewish Times. Uh, I'm Larry Gordon with uh, popular uh, author uh, Edwin Black from uh, Washington, D.C. He's here in Cedarhurst uh, tonight, uh, launching a, a new book, which we'll talk about in a moment. And uh, in a sense, uh, we were just uh, chit-chatting before we started, and uh, I was telling uh, Mr. Black that, uh, in a sense, he's one of my heroes because he opened up my mind back in 1984. Uh, I was a bit of a, uh, a bookworm in those days, you know, the pre-internet days when it was still, it was like cutting edge to read a whole book. So you know, it was really something else. Uh, and I read the book. Uh, uh, was that your first book, The Transfer Agreement? Was that the first book? That was my first book. My first so, so, so The Transfer Agreement, uh, uh, in brief, is about the relationship between the uh, pre-state uh, Zionist, the Jewish agency, right? The pre-state Jewish agency and, and, and the Nazis uh, in Germany, right? Uh, uh, and, that was my first book, but I've written right. a few since then. I know you've written quite a few. I have a whole whole collection here. But uh, my point that I want to make is that it was eye-opening, the communication between the uh, the uh, the Israelis uh, in those days and uh, and the Germans, because the Germans were desperate uh, for resources of some sort. Trucks, I think it was, right? They traded trucks. So that would be a different uh, issue. Uh, the trucks with uh, was with uh, uh, with uh, Joel Brandt. Uh, this was about the boycott. Uh, the transfer agreement is my first book. You're speaking of was uh, an effort to rescue some 55,000 Jews uh, by um, uh, transferring just uh, a pittance of their uh, assets uh, into Palestine, uh, in ex which would be um, uh, um, achieved by selling German goods. And in the process of doing that, uh, they killed the boycott against the Nazis. So it's a very complex deal. So, yeah, in a sense, they broke the boycott. So, but the titillating thing about reading it in those days was uh, that uh, it was uh, it was mind blowing in a sense uh, because uh, the preconceived notion at the time, of course, was the worst enemies in the world who would refuse to have anything to do with one another would be the uh, pre-state uh, Zionists uh, or the Jewish agency. Well, they uh, remained enemies. Uh, we have to understand that although people talk about the Zionists and the Nazis. Um, uh, collaborating, uh, this was a rescue. Uh, this, the identical move was done by Herzl after the Kishinev pogrom when he met with the Tsar. And he said, uh, if you, because the Tsar was willing to and determined to kill a third, export a third, or expel a third, and enslave a third. So Herzl said, uh, in the wake of all these pogroms that we will all know, especially Kishinev, if, if you want to kick these Jews out, kick them out, I will take them but uh, I also need their money to go with because we can't just go out destitute. Now, I'm going to come around to a different issue. Also, you, rem you will remember, because I'm sure you saw the movie, when Moses went to Pharaoh, he said, uh, let my people go. You saw the movie, yes, right? Yes. Okay. Um, it, but the goats and sheep must come with, so they needed their assets. And, of course, as you know, they went through town, they took reparations, et cetera, et cetera. It's actually from... Uh, that gold, that the golden calf was made. Now, let's shoot forward. Uh, when such a thing was not done uh, in the early 1950s, when 850,000 Jews were expelled penniless and stateless Sephardic Jews from Arab countries, 850,000, most of them landed in Israel, and they had nothing, but Israel did not keep them in tents, did not keep them in the refugee camps. They kept them in, um, they they absorbed them. They became virtually half the families of Eretz Yisrael, and uh, they became uh, approximately half of the power base of, of Israel. But to get back to your point, this uh, uh, story that I told uh, was um, very highly documented and uh, very shocking. And uh, uh, I would say, I, I think it would not be an, un an understatement to say a minute does not go by when someone is not tweeting or questioning or talking uh, about my first book, The Transfer Agreement. Um, but there were other books like, like the, gonna, like the we'll Farhood, et cetera. Yeah, okay, so we'll, we'll get to, we'll touch, on, we'll touch on, on a few of those. The point, that, the point though, is that you are uh, a researcher uh, and uh, a, a writer and, I guess, a historian, if you don't mind yes, me saying that, uh, who, as I said before we started recording, 
has the ability to scratch beneath the surface, sometimes deep, uh, deep beneath the surface, right. and you discover just uh, not only fantastic things, but you discover that the things that we see with the, our human eye and that we're able to perceive are really very far from the reality it's as they not exist. Enough, it's not enough to just discover it. You've got to be able to prove it, and you have to prove it time and time again. Remember, what is science? Science must be replicable. It can't be one man's opinion. If it's one man's opinion, it's a theory, which is what Einstein had. He had a theory of relativity. So we have to, it is enough to be sure. It is enough to be certain. You have to be able to document, to footnote, and it must be replicable so that so, someone else could prove the same. And in all of my uh, half century, uh, with uh, over 1.4 million books in print on IBM, General Motors, Rockefeller, Carnegie, um, Ford, uh, all of the people that I've investigated, there has not been one fact which has been uh, taken back, retracted, or modified. I've never been threatened with a, with a lawsuit, and that means one must be careful. Or as I tell the journalism students, tremble before you type. I, I, have, I have seen you uh, speak. Uh, I, I was present uh, a couple of, maybe uh, less than a year ago when you spoke at Rambam. At Masipta Rambam uh, here in uh, in the five and, towns, and, and you're coming t tonight at seven o'clock, right? I'm going to try to come tonight at seven o'clock, okay. um, uh, but uh, tonight you're here to, to launch a, a book with not uh, my book. Right. I'm, I'm here to launch Rabbi Yotav Eliach's book called Judaism, Zionism, and the Land of Israel. Just released a few hours ago. It's available in 17 countries. Anyone can go to Amazon and buy it. Unfortunately, you can't get it on Barnes and Noble for. for for another week or two, but uh, this is an extraordinary book that took um, Rabbi Eliach uh, decades to write. It's over 800 pages. Uh, I assisted him. Uh, he was backed by Dershowitz and by uh, uh, Yossi Klein Halevi and Martin Gilbert, the great historian. His publisher granted permission to reprint uh, maps. And what Yotav Eliach does is he bridges the distance between the diplomatic juridical, historical, and military histories with the issue of religion, with the issue of Judaism, with the issue of God that underpins all of it. You know, the great premise of the American purview anyway is to, of course, up until very recently, perhaps even presently, is to keep religion and state uh, apart. So most books either deal with uh, religious aspect of subjects like this, or they deal with the, the history, uh, which a lot of it is attributed to, you know, coincidence or military strategy. But uh, apparently from what you're saying, from what I read, his book uh, brings the two together and makes them very compatible. That's right. And, it, it, and he brings them together, not only in the spiritual sense, but in a factual sense. So he deals with the factuality of the religion as the underpinning for all of these other factors. And it's a book that uh, uh, people who are not uh, uh, observant, like myself and Dershowitz and others, uh, have found compelling because it explains quite a bit. So uh, I'm, I'm recommending it, and we're going to be launching it tonight at 7 o'clock at Rambam uh, Masifta, and tomorrow at Rabbi Abadi's uh, synagogue in, uh, in, in Manhattan, at Manhattan East on, on 3rd. And um, uh, it's a, a thrill for me to help someone else get his book out uh, since uh, I've had 1.4 million shots at it for my own. I mean, uh, your books are, are really, uh, uh, if someone could manage to read all of them, is certainly the equivalent of probably uh, an, a graduate degree uh, of some sort because it really covers a, a lot of ground and it's really breathtaking in the history that you uh, managed to, to communicate. The, uh, the interesting thing is every time I tried to get away from the Holocaust, I kept getting back to the Holocaust. For instance, uh, uh, I first wrote about the transfer agreement, and then I said, okay, uh, I'm done with that. Now I'll work on eugenics, which was an American um, uh, gen genocide against p people who did not conform to uh, a Nordic or an Aryan stereotype. And I found out that, lo, lo and behold, uh, uh, eugenics was launched up the street in uh, uh, Cold Spring Harbor and was exported uh, into Nazi Germany by the Carnegie Institution and the Rockefeller Foundation and even uh, sponsored the program that sent Mengele into Auschwitz. When I was done with that, I said, okay, I'll get away from that. 
Um, and now I'll work on petroleum. At that time, we were having an oil problem. I invented the term oil addiction, and I invented the term petropolitics. And I said, I'll just deal with the history of, Bag of Baghdad. That took me to none other than the Mufti of Jerusalem and the 1941 uh, Farhud, the pogrom against uh, um, the uh, uh, Jews of Baghdad, the, the alliance with the Nazis, so, uh, the expulsion of the Jews that I just mentioned. So once again, that brought me back to the Holocaust. Then I did Internal Combustion, a book on the history of transportation and energy. Where did I end, uh, end up? General Motors is making the Blitz truck for the Blitz Krieg and enabling the Nazis to conquer Europe. Um, uh, uh, General Motors acted uh, as a war criminal along with the Ford and, um, uh, and uh, Thomas Watson. When I was done with that, I then went uh, to, um, uh, uh, I wrote about the Farhood. Mm -hmm. I wrote about, uh, I put them all together in one book called Nazi Nexus so people could buy one slender book and see all the five major culprit uh, um, companies. And then recently I wrote uh, about uh, Financing the Flames, which was about these NGOs. And uh, uh, I was the one actually who broke the story of terrorists getting salaries, which uh, resulted in the Taylor Force Act. So I'm very proud of this. So um, uh, we we have just a couple of minutes because we promised to. Uh, but I'll be back. Even that's so great. Next, next time I'm, I'm All right, that, that's that's great. What are you working on now? What's the next book? I've got be about? five books that I'm working on now. Um, I'm working on. Uh, uh, I'm connecting uh, the um, uh, the Nazis in uh, in in Berlin to an earlier genocide in Africa in 1906. I'm working on uh, the history of Israel. Uh, from a, um, uh, a juridical and uh, uh, legal and diplomatic sense. Um, I'm uh, working on a, um, a secret project involving sur surveillance that will combine the, um, uh, the, um, the shock of IBM and the Holocaust, uh, the threat of, um, of, eu of eugenics, and uh, amplify it all into something that uh, could really astonish everyone. It's coming a lot faster than, than I thought. So I'm working on about five different books. So you spend your, your day uh, writing? Do you manage to just uh, uh, discipline yourself to sit and write? Or do you lecture more often? Which, uh, which do you prefer? Right now, right now I'm lecturing more often. I'm also doing an interesting book on the Arab slave trade and the history of the Arab slave trade, which I think has been completely overlooked. Um, I spend most of my time uh, during certain months uh, um, lecturing. I do about 200 lectures a year. And some, and once in a while, I do interviews on Facebook Live uh, for newspapers in Lawrence. Like now? Yeah, like now. This would be a good example. And, uh, of course, I syndicate some stories. So basically, all day, all night, I'm either reading, I'm either um, uh, writing, or I'm researching. Uh, the first thing I do in the morning when I wake up is I read the overnight mails, the reports, the historical information, the analysis, take care of all of my events, and uh, prepare for my next books. So one more question. Can I, can I ask you about President Trump? I know you haven't written about him, but you probably will someday. Where, what, do you, where, how, what do you anticipate uh, his place in, in history in, in context of uh, your you know, subject matter in terms of the Middle East and the uh, situation with North Korea as uh, it's evolving currently. Uh, you want to give me a little bit of a, uh, an inkling as to where your thought process you know, takes you? Usually in my events and all of my media, uh, I do not allow any political questions. But speaking as a historian, I think that the big picture will be uh, what uh, might be done with North Korea, uh, certainly what has been done with Jerusalem, Certainly what has been done with the economic factors in um, uh, taking the money away from the PA. Um, I think it'll be a great, 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 great challenge for historians to reconstruct the er era because there's so much that's wrong and fake. And a person like myself who has gone into contemporary sources to see what people were thinking would have never encountered the level of... Uh, of uh, 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 of confusion, falsity, and bias in the media 
that I'm observing today. So the record uh, is yet to be written, but the challenge of writing that record will be profound, and uh, I, I don't know how accurate it can be. Probably there will be several histories. Okay, we're going to let you go. Uh, we'll be, uh, this is live, so uh, we can say you'll be uh, at Rambam Masifta in Lawrence tonight yes, uh, what, at 7 p.m. What about this? What about it? Well, that's, this we'll, is one of the fattest newspapers I've ever seen in the Jewish community, and uh, I know how hard it is. You, you, you know what we used to say? I used to publish papers. Yeah. Uh, no newspaper gets up without one sleepless night right. <laughs> on the That's deadline. Right. That Although, not... well, we should do a show on that. The technology has changed very dramatically. Yeah. You know, it's clean. Your hands can stay clean all day and all night these days. Yeah. You know, publishing a newspaper it wasn't like that. Uh, I would say ten, twelve years ago. No, I mean, but the uh, technology changed very dramatically. I mean, do your readers know what an exacto knife is? I don't think so. I don't think any. I don't think okay. anybody I'm does. I'm just going to so. leave. My, I have to leave. So, you, but I'm going to leave with this. When we used to have to correct a, a typo, like you want the word now instead of not. Yeah. You take a knife, right. cut out the one letter, and put the other letter in and position it, correct? Cut it out of the plate. I don't go that far back, but I do remember when we had to ship, instead of emailing the finished the finish product to uh, our printer, we had to put it in a car service and send it down. Oh, of course. And if there was... Those were and, the flats. And, and here in New York, if there was traffic on the Brooklyn Queens Expressway, right. the paper just came out late well, the next that's, day. That's why CBS had uh, these guys in the motorcycles, and they used to deliver things. Uh, remember, they used to go in between the traffic. Remember that? Right. The famous CBS couriers. Our guest has been uh, the great historian and author, uh, Edwin Black, and... Uh, He's a man that uh, makes a uh, tremendous impact on the thought process uh, of the globe. And that's, uh, that's not a small responsibility uh, to have. And we look forward to uh, your future work. And we thank you very much for, uh, for joining us. Thank you for having me. Right. Have a good night. Bye-bye.